So let's continue with further keynote lectures. Dr. Paul Becker is our next speaker, Vice President of the German Weather Service and renowned climate expert in Germany and holder of the most important climate network, climate system, and so best positioned to tell us what climate change means. It's first of all about measurements, observations, and so it's very important to always be accompanied by the German Weather Service and they help us to collect the data we need, climatology today, tomorrow and beyond. We see that there is a new uh, aspect, new paradigm, because climatology in the past was focused on the past, but today it's also about extrapolation, immediate future. Uh, for the medium range future, medium run future, it's even e it's a bit easier, but for the immediate future, it's the trickiest thing. So it's hard to make the good forecasts. For 2100, you have made forecasts, and they uh, are have more certainty than the forecast for the next 10 years. You have the word. So, dear Christian, many thanks for the kind words of introduction. You see, I changed the title a bit. Climatology today, tomorrow and beyond. I changed it when reading it yesterday. I said uh, it would suffice to be more modest, so just uh, beyond has been dropped. What's the general outline? I want to show you how we can actually make climatology. It's not about showing you what, cli what climate was in the past and what it will be in the future. We heard about it, we will hear more about it. It's, and I will not focus on Saxony or the regions. No, it's about a toolbox. The toolbox we use when we want to make a statement, a forecast then we need properly functioning tools. Without those tools, no use to try, and we will run into a lot of criticism. What is important is the driver behind. Why do we do this? Why are we doing this? Then we have the picture of the uh, WHO. And all most of you are likely to know this. We, and then we have the developing countries, we are, uh, who, which are mostly hit by the consequences of climate change. And then we have the two bases, the two footings, good observation, monitoring, and good projections, modeling simulations, and ideas about consequences of climate change. So, these are the two pillars, the two footings our work is based on. When having a look at the two bases, we say climate, we see climate data observations, but I will not speak about this. And in the future, we will have a look into one or two centuries even. This is the range we are set in between. I say meteorologists, meteorologists and climatologists are old-fashioned word. <laughs> so the difference is about disappearing. So. So sorry, so I hope it's better now. So no more climatology on one hand and meteorology on the other. We will have to go together and together we will approach the future. 
Und, und noch ein Wort. Mich interessiert an der And Stelle again, nicht nur das Klima I'm selber, only interested das, in climate itself, also not um uh, consequences, uh, how to handle risks and impact research. No, that's not my uh, subject. It's now about understanding climate on the base of the climate data. You know about the weather station. Yesterday we visited the Fichtelberg weather station, time series, long time series, good observations, coherent results. However, we have certain problems uh, above oceans. How about that? Are data, is data homogeneous? How about the measuring technology and the inbuilt certainty? So very important remote sensing by satellite, radar, and what is new and very important is reanalysis. Maybe it's uh, new to some of you. And we're going to have new measuring technologies, measure measuring equipment, we should know, we should be aware of the industry. Measuring technology can ac actually make money, and that is why there is a lot of research in uh, under this aspect. So we cannot say what we're using now, we are going to use that also within 50 years now. There will be a lot of change, and on the basis of these three points, remote sensing, no radar system, and uh, optimized measuring technologies uh, and processes. Ganz ist für mich das Radar. radar is um, das Radar one of the crucial items for me. Radar is one of the absolute key tools we are using in Germany. We use it, we have to use it, it's our most critical tool. And arm to observe, not to master, but to observe climate change. We have the best measuring network control system, radar system, here in Germany, the best of the world, almost 200 kilometers of coverage, of clear coverage, and we went beyond. The dual polar technology was used. We, we are now able to differentiate hydro meteor aspects two sentences about our philosophy this is the scan strategy behind our work every five minutes we have the radar beam running across the area uh, this is the precipitation scan the uh, near ground precipitation levels and so we have a rather good uh, understanding and observation of how much precipitation is in Germany. We can actually dif differentiate between the type of uh, precipitation. So several years ago, that would not have been possible. You see the precipitation track, and, when, and you can also read the type of precipitation we have. And this changes everything. Climatologically, it's no change because time series are not long enough. But over the next few years, we will gain more and more insight and will have first climatological findings. So this is actually the tune of tomorrow. And we will have to rethink things which we believed to be correct Will, be have to, will have to be questioned. You see Saxony, part of Saxony, ground measuring network, extreme precipitation and radar meteorology. You see time windows are not matching, but the patterns have changed. I even do not know whether it's climatology climatology, but we see new patterns and we will have to ask why are patterns different. We will have to look into that in close detail. And this picture is maybe not so obvious, but the two above pictures show the border area between uh, Czech Republic and Germany and Poland and uh, Germany. On the left-hand side, we uh, have just few 
mapping data. On the right hand side, we have more. So, if we succeed in extending the cooperation between our neighbors, uh, between us and our neighbors, both for the ground uh, data and for the rad radar data, and if we come to a common stra strategic approach, then we will. This will be a win-win situation, and I'm very glad to know that we have colleagues from Czech Republic and from Poland. It's very important to have a more intense cooperation because precipitation and weather is a cross-border uh, ph phenomenon. What will be the step, next step? Is it's actually a kind of enthusiasmating. It's about using today's measuring methods. We actually use them very well, well but to, to add, so to see radar, radar precipitation correlation with uh, river levels. We need long time series. We have first time series, but they are not long enough for trend statements. But I do not want to speak about post-processing, but I have to add this now. Precipitation falls, rain falls, then is followed by runoff models, edge models, boundary models. And when speaking about uh, municipal and uh, regional, local areas, then there will be a coupling with other models, runoff models and uh, edge models. And we have, and when bringing that together, we will have new chances and opportunities. I try to show you that here. Yeah, it works. Just look. What have we seen? We saw precipitation in uh, correlation with runoff models and edge models, edge just meaning, for example, uh, sidewalks, pavements. So, but when you, you look at that, you actually can have localized models for your region, district, town, whatever, then you actually will know where the, run, where the streams go. And depending on the amount of precipitation, but anyhow, there will be the problem of communication. How will I communicate this situation? Once you have a model like this and you show that in public, and then when uh, somebody is the owner of a uh, property or house, a building like this shown here, maybe in the mid of a runoff stream, then it will be also a question of uh, value once you enter the public. So we have radar, can link that, integrate that in localized models in order to come to rather precise uh, consequence statements. The next point I'd like to discuss as an important matter, and where I see progress, is reanalysis. What is that reanalysis? Uh, and what can we do with this tool? Just to give you an outline, this is an article, I do not know where it comes from, in 2014, the globally warmest year or not? What's the typical response? We have a look at our weather stations and we say this temperature. Yes, but it's not only partly correct when referring to measuring stations. And we say that what what has been measured is correct, but is that true? We have also other approaches. Era interim analysis here 
as an example, instead of a reanalysis, including the poles. Then you cannot say 2014 was the warmest year. It was not. It so it's also about small print. What do we do and what's the background, what's behind? But once using the reanalysis on a global scale, then we will have a change in how we see things. Let's have a look at the next example, motivation example. Why is that so important? This morning we already spoke about regenerative energies and what can be done and cannot be done here in Germany. We have not a problem, no, not a problem, but we have a change. Somebody who, who built a, small, a smaller wind plant, a wind generator, is no longer up to date. We have uh, much more higher wind towers, but we do not actually know how the wind situation is at that level. But once we want to set up 150 meter high uh, wind generators, wind turbines, then we will have to see that not all of the wind farms will be, will be placed in the north of Germany. And you may know Germany is a federal country, so every regional state has its own jurisdiction in such a tent, in such a, an aspect. So only reanalysis will allow us to get access to the high levels of atmospheric layers also as a political tool. Very, very quick, similar to weather forecast, initial conditions, then at a certain point you will have an analysis and results. For, for re-analysis, it's different. You have the same tool, basically, same model, but you will not allow it to run it freely, to run freely, but you urge or you channel the data according to certain aspects. And why is reanalysis so important and so successful? In contrast with normal forecast, we are able to correct afterwards. We have global reanalysis as a boundary setup. There are certain advantages. It's not just extracting data from the basis, but it's a philosophical approach. And this philosophy urges you to freeze your models at a certain point. So you cannot correct any time and continue to correct. No, it's very important to freeze your model. You decide where to freeze your model which will then be used for reanalysis. Model-based reanalysis, 6 by 6 kilometers is good, 2 by 2 is possible. And that would be useful for regenerative power. And then we will have a powerful tool for observation data in order to know about the wind conditions. Radar, I, I have to repeat, radar is the a key tool for precipitation measurements, high resolution measurements. The second is reanalysis in order to generate the fields we cannot obtain from radar, especially wind, and the, and the two can then be used for modeling. It's a kind of aspect change, a clear, important change, and this is a kind of a quantum leap highly relevant for the individual German states. It's a federal uh, uh, state, as already said, so we have very small deciding levels, decision-making levels, and can be used in the regional states. Just to give you an idea that it actually works, and it's not just uh, some rubbish I'm telling you here. So this is a station 
actually measuring the data we use. Bremen and Garmisch-Partenkirchen, the green line is the high resolution. So we have two less, two low resolution lines and one high resolution line, the green one. But what is problematic is that once we have a highly differentiated local area like in Garmisch-Partenkirchen in the Alps, then we see that the results show less coherence. But it's not a catastrophe, so it works well. But the complexer the terrain, the land, the, the less faithful or the less coherent the data is. And this is the coast, Putbus, Baltic Sea, coast. There you see the reanalysis, the localized green analysis shows a very good match. It works. The decisive point, altitude, because this is what we want to know in terms of the wind profile and only at the actual tower you can do it. Here you see the mast, measuring mast, red is the measured data and blue is the reanalyzed data. And you see immediately the tool is able to find the actual wind conditions and to give us the actual wind conditions at various altitudes. altitudes. On the left hand side measured data at various levels, right hand side the simulated reanalyzed data, you see a kind of kink in the slope at a very at the uppermost, uppermost level. But it's not uh, actually destroying our tool. It's, it remains a powerful tool. It's able to acquire and detect level-related wind data. Just to give you an impression, an idea of how it looks like during a day, comparison between 10 meters altitude and 116 meters altitude above ground. You see the regional and local structures, it actually works. What are the challenges for the future? We know we have a more and more improved measuring equipment and so we need very good data and once we have a new measuring equipment or process then we will, be ha we will have to be careful because the data will have a kind of different basis as to resolution. The grid resol resolution grid is 2 kilometers by 2 kilometers and then we will see that correlation with uh, other models will allow us to come to conclusive statements. After remote sensing radar and reanalysis, let's have a look into upcoming measuring technology. Yesterday we visited the Fichtelberg measuring station. A lot is underway in the industries. It's not about, uh, this was about snow level, but it's not so important. Here we have a snow scale, snow weighing equipment. It's one solution for uh, snow precipitation, solid precipitation. The second solution is a GPS-based determination. It's a ground-based sensor and looks into the height of uh, the um, snow cover. It's, it's, uh, it's low cost, it's, it's a very simple tool, it's a piece of, piece of cake. So, but we will have to see whether it works under practical conditions. It's very important not to get stuck to old things and say, we did it always like this, it will continue to work. No, in this uh, measuring technology aspect, we should get away from old things. We have to make drastic changes, not about terrorism, by the way. So, but we will have to equip uh, city trains, metro, metros or similar things. 
and cities are actually uh, interested. The mayors would like to be uh, environmentally aware in public and they actually would like to uh, place measuring stations, urban measuring stations. It will cost some money, but it will raise awareness, general awareness. This is also cost worthy. In order to see what the results are in a non-representative place, because we normally use representative places for our measuring stations. What I do not have here is the change of thinking due to new technologies. You all have, I'm sure, uh, something like this, a smartphone in the past. We had people actually observing things. Now we have automated items, but what is also important is to commission, to commit uh, students, pupils, people in the street in order to provide them with apps and they can measure at any place where they are random on a random basis, so to say. So the pupils in schools, the students in schools or at universities can actually use apps in the USA. They, are, they have made much more progress. These are very interesting opportunities. It's not about representativeness of the results. Maybe uh, some people actually mani manipulate in places where you normally would not measure. But I think it is worth while, <laughs> and we should try to do this. Uh, but we, we have to avoid that Amazon and Google actually get hold of our measuring stations. That is not what I would like to do. It's not in our national interest, not in the European interest. No, the question is, I would say, citizen science as a keyword to ask, to integrate, to commit people interested in such things. This is an actual challenge. It's not about, about magic. No, people are there. There are a lot of chairs at universities in every uh, regional state of Germany. We have uh, university professors dealing with that. But it is important to bring it into practice, to put it into practice. But on the other hand, we have a tradition, our observations, philological observators. We have a tradition. Now it's about using the new equipment to involve young people. It's also about fun. It's new life. So this was about uh, citizen science and real regular measuring networks. Uh, I already made the statement, the provocative uh, uh, statement that meteorology and uh, climatology, there is not so much difference anymore. And why do I uh, tell you this? Because the tools that we use, uh, we cannot differentiate between climatology and meteorology. So 20 years ago, we had uh, models for weather forecast and we had models for climate. So there were big differences between them. And this gap, it was a technological gap, not much, not, ma not more. It's also nothing magic to close this gap. Of course, you have to look where you are at. So when you look at an American, a seasonal forecast is a classic tool. In Germany, it's a little bit difficult because for the seasonal forecast, you need a big ocean uh, left and right. And just because of the Baltic Sea and North Sea, we don't have this. But Germany is a different country. Uh, we don't want to make predictions only for Germany. We are embedded in a global context. To have predictions also for other places in the world is as important now as it is for Germany. And so these tools can be used in a massive way, and there is even potential to further develop the system that we have reliable 
uh, statements even for a country as Germany. So our French colleagues and British colleagues for them it's business as usual and we will also do this. So what is still missing there are the decadic um, predictions so the next 10, 20 years. So this is still uh, research but when I talk to my colleague uh, it's not research anymore. It's already set. So we will get a tool for this. Uh, it might be not as good as weather forecast, but for a trend it's sufficient. So this will not be uh, the day after tomorrow. It actually will be tomorrow. This is also a reason why I crossed out beyond. So we start at the back the last 100 years, we start reanalysis. Uh, we have the weather forecast, we have uh, climate projections, and we use this operationally. So this will not be a research approach, it will be operational, actually. So and there is one more uh, item I want to talk about, and this is downscaling, the question of downscaling. First, the question is, what is downscaling? So an American interprets downscaling differently than a Bavarian. <laughs> Hopefully there is no Bavarian here, but of course... <laughs> Yeah, everything is okay, so all free I like all free states the same way. So an American feels differently about downscaling than a German person and a Saxon person, but it doesn't matter on which scale we are. Downscaling is a topic and that's something we want to do something about it. And how we do it, this question, the approaches. So I say it's important, downscaling is important. And I like uh, the statistical downscaling uh, more and more, and I will tell you why right away. Downscaling for the scales I will talk about, not downscaling for weather forecast, but for seasonal prediction it's not nonsense, and also for decadic uh, uh, prediction it's really essentially. So in Germany there is a a strong Arne tradition. So Anne Speckert is here. We have Vetrec, we have stars, we have a long tradition and good and, uh, results. We generated good results. And my approach is uh, not only to keep this know-how, but to further develop this know-how. And I don't want uh, to do a bashing of dynamic climate models or something. And I won't read all these uh, items, but two or three things are very important. So statistic is very efficient. You don't need many resources, and you can do it uh, very fast, quickly, and it's almost no bias. But uh, you have to use the simulation data, and this is station-based, so the question is if you have this uh, data, but there are solutions for this. What is important for me, we have to use it, and we should not use at the absolute values, we should look for trends, we should look for enamel Anomalous, and uh, we will use this. So this is the key message. Uh, statistic downscaling is a highly efficient method, cost-efficient method, and we should keep this. So this is not something for the day after tomorrow, not something for tomorrow, that's something that we have already now and that we could further develop and it's really worth to keep it. And so that's our, how it looks like today and what it can do, everything. So it just uh, tells you that statistical downscaling can really tell you what will happen during the next years, but you know about this. So, uh, our weather service, we, we are very happy that there is Vetrek and Star Trek and so on, and we are very excited what will happen. So that's already the end of my lecture. What I wanted to show you is regarding the measurements and the observations, monitoring what happens 
So we analysis, you have to get used to it, but there is a big potential to it. And sometimes without we analysis, it's not possible anymore. And measuring technology, there is really thrive to it. The industry is doing something about this. There are new uh, measuring equipments. Um, that we haven't dreamed of. So there are new solutions and how we can evolve uh, our people, uh, the people in the street, to have people that are interested in meteorology and that uh, contribute to measurements. So season prediction, how does it look like and what are the focuses and so on. Thank you very much. So thank you for the interesting insights. So the micro for the translators, thank you very much to Paul Becker for the interesting insights. And now the time is correct again, so we are back in the program, so uh, we can ask for questions. Dr. Schwarzer and Professor Grünewald. Uh, Dr. Becker, you showed impressively how important quality of data registration is important and the stations still have a function because of backup and monitoring and so on. And regarding yesterday, the Fischelberg weather station, what does the human have? What play a role will the human uh, play in extreme conditions uh, in quality management? So the human person in quality management will play a role, but not on site. When you look at extreme locations, so what we did in the past and what was the problem in the past, for example, snow measurement. So on a hill there is snow somewhere, there is no snow and so on, and this bar that we used for measuring and the water equivalent, so the person had to look for an average area and then he melted the snow and so on. So this was already tricky in the past. So this was extremely difficult in the past and a lot of uh, strain and stress on the people. So we have to get away from this and to use more often such sensors will be really a win and not a loss. So we get better in this. So the question about iced uh, equipment or a failure of equipment because of ice, uh, so when you have human people there, he will see it, he can do something about this. So with automatic systems, the maintenance concept is very important and we can see it when uh, the systems fail. Uh, we have a concept uh, how to uh, maintain these systems and how to repair the systems. So with the measuring systems, we can uh, do things that we could not do before and we should not overestimate uh, the person what they can do. Many things were not be able to be done in the past. So I see even in extreme locations with the new system in combination with the remote sensing that I showed you, we will have a better result than in the past. What is it about? We have post-processing things so a runoff model, and so we need the correct values so that the system can work. So very precise, reliable data values. And, and so with the automatic measuring systems, uh, there will be more to it in the future. So I'm really convinced about this, as we wouldn't do this. Uh, I don't want to ask any questions about the measuring uh, systems. 
Uh, your re-analysis uh, was very impressive to me, and also your statement that uh, meteorologists and climatologists uh, are more combined now, and you said that we have to freeze the models. This is important. And so you compared uh, the edge uh, models. When you do something like this, you also have to freeze the models there if you want to use the reanalysis there. And then the meteorologist, the climatologist, and the hydrologist even have to work closer together. Yeah, that's also what I think. So hydrologists and meteorologists already talk together, uh, have been talking together for many years. So there are also uh, meteorology services that are also called hydrology services. So uh, this is really combined and it's very close together. So, so of course, I agree with you completely. So uh, talking to each other really in an intensive way. I wanted to start off actually differently than I start off. So the relation of the German Weather Service to the federal states is very important because hydrology is on the municipal level and on the state level, not on a federal level. So the decisions are made in the uh, municipality, so talking to each other, uh, cooperate, and to make sure, so when the drop is in the sky, and still in the air, then it's our drop, but when it's at the bottom, at the, at the ground, then it's your drop. So this is a cooperation, so it's not a question how we measure this, but the person wants to know a precise prediction when the drop hits the ground how many drops uh, there will be and the duration. So, so that's what the hydrologist needs to know for post-processing. So communication between the federal states and uh, the federal uh, part so we have an agreement with every federal state and so the federal offices so, so we sit together once a year to see how we can optimize it. So the knowledge that we generate, so the German Weather Service, it's uh, 2,500 people, so 2,350 people, so that's a lot and we can do a lot. And so this knowledge to distribute this to the different states so I, I think it's uh, my responsibility or our responsibility to share this knowledge. But we need these uh, bilateral talks between uh, the local offices and uh, the German Weather Service and to see what is coming, what we can do about it, and what we cannot do about it. So I think uh, this was very successful over the last years. So we are playing a different game. Uh, now than what we played uh, 10 years ago. We can still improve something, but I'm very optimistic in this. And there is one more thing uh, that I wanted to say. So radar means a big improvement, but when you look at climate series, when things are changed, they get better, but they can uh, change, and then you need uh, long-term parallel measurement. So, and also reanalysis are based and greater. So thank you for this question. We know about this, and we, um, we keep, so we keep this over many years. So we will see if we can use this eternally, but uh, for a long period. We know this problem and we detected the problem and this is a very great uh, scientific challenge actually. So I thought at the beginning it's very boring, but now we employed a young girl and what she is producing there, that's great. So we keep this in our eyes.